All right. Good morning and uh, welcome back to our um, Thursday morning Bible study. It's great to be with you today. And um, we are in the midst of a study of um, First Corinthians. And today we are getting into chapter 16. Good morning, Jewel. I hope you're doing well, sister. And we're in 1 Corinthians chapter 16. And as we were approaching uh, chapter 16, I started getting questions from some of you folks who uh, follow this study with us about the collection. And then I've noticed on some of the uh, groups for the church on social media that there are some uh, stirring up again an old false teaching that had been answered a long time ago about uh, the contribution. And so I'm going to take and uh, get into a discussion about here in regard to 16, 1 and 2, about the context, what Paul is teaching. And then from there, we'll springboard out and look at uh, some of the questions that have come up in regard to this text. So in 1 Corinthians 15 or 16, 1 and 2, now concerning the collection for the saints, as I have given order to the churches of Galatia, even so do ye. Upon the first day of the week, let every one of you lay by him in store, as God hath prospered him, that there be no gatherings when I come. So in, in regard to the context of 1 Corinthians 16, 1 and 2, we have um, the collection for the saints. Now, Paul had been working very diligently to try to restore uh, really a good line of fellowship between the Jews and Gentiles in the church. And, you know, you don't have to read very much of the New Testament to realize there were many issues between the two groups. Um, Acts chapter 6, for example, there is a contention that has arisen in the church there in uh, Judea because uh, the Grecian widows were being overlooked in the ministration, right? They're taking care of uh, these uh, elderly sisters. And so they, they felt that some were not getting cared for like others. Uh, Acts uh, 15. There you have a, a text that we would call sometimes the Jerusalem Council, where at, uh, there were different brethren from different places that came together to talk about uh, the problems that were coming out of the church in Judea. And brethren were going out and saying, except ye be circumcised after the manner of Moses, ye cannot be saved. And you see in the Galatians epistle what uh, that was doing to the church. When Paul talks about another gospel, which is not another, that's what he's getting at. They were changing the gospel of Christ by adding parts of the old law to it. They were saying, hey, it's great. You can embrace this new teaching if you want, but you're still going to have to hang on to uh, some premises of the old law. You can't do that. That creates a new gospel. So Paul is working overtime to try to heal this division. And he has been out preaching the gospel, establishing churches of Christ in the known world of his day. And he is wanting those new found uh, founded congregations to get on board, to put a collection together. He's going to go back to Jerusalem. He wants to take that money down to help the poor saints in Jerusalem and uh, 
try to bridge, make a bridge for their fellowship there. So what he's getting at here in 1 Corinthians 16, 1 and 2, is that when he's coming through, and he's, he's going to be coming there, um, he says, uh, look in um, verse 5, now, I will come unto you when I shall pass through Macedonia, for I do pass through Macedonia. And it may be that I will abide with you and winter with you, that ye may be, bring me on my journey whithersoever I go. So, you know, he is on his way down to Jerusalem. And as he is traveling, he wants these congregations to have what they've decided, what they've determined to, to send to Jerusalem to help those poor saints down there. So he wants them to have it ready so they are to put that money together. Now, some read this and think, well, you know what? The church wanted to give on the first day of the week as, um, as we do, as our uh, scriptural tradition is um, uh, from the word of God as it is dictated by the truth, right? We do this on the first day of the week. Now, out of this idea here in 16.1, you have the statement collection for the saints. You've probably heard of the saints only doctrine. Some of you may even embrace that, that not a penny from the, the treasury, the Lord's money, can be used to help a non-believer. And that's a doctrine that is still, unfortunately, running around. And it's been answered time and time again. And we'll spend some time looking at that as well. Now, back in... Uh, Oh, man, it may have been 92. I, I can't remember exactly when. The very early 90s, I, was, uh, I, I received um, a work. I, I had applied for a work, and I took that work. And there were problems in that congregation. Now, the brethren with whom I met, had uh, they, they stated to me that we'll have these problems taken care of before you get here. Well, the, they didn't, and it uh, eventually split the church. And this group was um, pretty slick in what they were doing. They were teaching that uh, the Great Commission of Matthew 28, 18 through 20 was given to the apostles only, and they, in, in less than 30 years, fulfilled that commission, uh, Colossians 1, uh, talks about how the gospel had gone out into all the world. And so the commission was over, chapter closed. There isn't a child of God under the sun today bound under that great commission. Well, that's false doctrine. That commission applies to you and to me. And uh, I'm afraid that we live in a day and time when a lot of brethren don't understand that they are obligated by Christ and his teaching to go out and make disciples, to do everything they can to make disciples. And that's one of the reasons that I have uh, committed myself to the Fishers of Men work and teach Fishers of Men classes because brethren need to learn how to do it. And it is not a difficult thing, and uh, there are ways to effectively teach the Word of God. If you want to know more about that, uh, send me an email and I'll hook you up in one of the classes. And, um, you know, it uh, takes about 11 weeks or so to get through it online. So if you want to do that, let me know. I'll help you. But this group, uh, they also taught that because when the Lord instituted the Lord's Supper, he said that the bread was his body and the cup was his blood. So when someone around the table would be in prayer and say to the Father, uh, we thank thee for this bread that represents the body of thy son or this cup that represents his blood, 
well, they would throw a cow. They said, that's false doctrine. And um, they're, as I said, they were pretty slick. They even had some, some uh, good, well-known preachers in the St. Louis area supporting them and denying that they were teaching error. It took a while to get them to see the truth there, too. But then as far as the collection, they went to 1 Corinthians 16, 1 and 2, and they said, hey, what the Bible teaches about the collection is that it was for the saints. And they understood the context that it was for uh, the poor saints in Jerusalem. That's what 16, 1 and 2 is dealing with. And so they said, we don't have that problem today. We're not required to give. Oh, my. And you you want to kill a church, you just uh, take away its uh, reason for giving, and you'll kill it. So this is really an important subject. And by the way, that group finally uh, they split off and started another congregation out there. And um, you know we had to withdraw fellowship from them for their false doctrine. And the church that uh, stood up is doing great today. I mean, they are really doing well. All right. So the collection for the saints. I've uh, explained briefly the context here. And as I'm going through some of this, you feel free to ask any questions about the collection that you would like to ask. Uh, you see that um, one of the points out of 16.1 is that there is a pattern principle uh, in the New Testament. And uh, the Lord has dictated that pattern that is to be followed, and we cannot uh, violate the, the Lord's will there. We can't add to the pattern. We can't take away from it. We can't decide that, hey, we, we will give on uh, Wednesday night. That'll be the time we take up the collection. Now, I need to pause right here and make a point. We can go beyond what we do on the Lord's day. And I've been in various places where there was a, a real tremendous need that came up during the week. And on Wednesday night, we talked about that need. And we made the point that if you've got some extra greenbacks in your wallet, and remind you, this is prior Bidenomics, right? Oh, my. What a, what a, what a fiasco that has become. But... Um, so we would uh, take up a collection to meet that need. What is wrong with that? Not a thing. We are to be benevolent. One of the works of the church is benevolence. And uh, by the way, our benevolence doesn't stop with regard to the saints. The context, again, of 1 Corinthians 16, 1 and 2 is how Paul was going to go through the area. He wanted the funds put together so he didn't have to sit around and say, now y'all run around and get this money together. He could get it and go and, and start heading down to Jerusalem. So I, I have, um, I don't know, I have a lot of thoughts regarding the, the saints only error. But really before I get into that, I think that we would do well to uh, establish the pattern for giving as it is taught in the New Testament. Let's, let's turn to Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2 is the first day of worship in the Church of Christ. And, you know, you can look through this and, and uh, answer several of the false doctrines that come out of the non-institutional churches of Christ. Um, let me explain that. I'm not trying to use uh, an inflammatory term. This is a term they have designated for themselves. They call 
folks like me institutional. And if you want to uh, listen to a really good sermon on that topic, you go to the, uh, man, there's a guy named Victor Askew. And uh, he's down in Florida, Oceanside or something like that. They have a website. And you can Google it and, and come up with the uh, sermon there that he preached uh, answering that particular error about uh, non-institutionalism. It's a term they have uh, created for themselves because we would uh, support, um, say, a preaching school. I went uh, to university and and obtained a biblical degree. I paid for that out of my own pocket. I went to the Memphis School of Preaching a, a long time ago, and other brethren, other churches supported me while I was in school, and they supported the school. And uh, this group would say, that's false doctrine. You can't do that. You're violating the the Lord's teaching because the church isn't in the school business or orphans homes, right? Um, I've been in places where we have financially supported orphans homes and they would say, that's another institution. That's not the church. Well, yeah, it is. It's not the church, but the church has the obligation to be benevolent and to help in those areas. So I'm not going to unfold a lot of that unless I get some more questions about that. I want to defer you to Victor's uh, sermon. You can download that, watch it uh, on online, and it is excellent. It really is good. So I don't feel the need to have to unfold that or unpack that any further. But here on the day of Pentecost, the church is established. And there were 3,000 souls added to the church that day. Now, the uh, disciples, the apostles had been baptized by John. And his baptism was for the remission of sins. So when the remission of sins opened up, Acts 2, they were in the church. They didn't have to be baptized again, you see. Now, at that point, John's baptism became invalid. Nobody else can claim they've been baptized in John's baptism. There's one baptism, Ephesians 4, 4, and it is the baptism discussed in Acts 2, 38, for the remission of sins. Now, there were that day... Like, like I said earlier, 3,000 souls were added to them, verse 41, added to the disciples. So this is the church now. And they're going to worship. It's the first day of the week. Now, in regard to the Lord's Supper, right, this uh, group of non-institutionalists, as they call themselves. So, and by the way, isn't that division right there? making a distinction about yourself that is not in the Bible. That's division. That's divisive. But uh, here you have a group that will often, uh, they, they uh, you probably heard the term one cuppers because Jesus took the cup and said, you know, drink ye all of it. And uh, that one cup, they say, well, the pattern says we've got to have one cup. Well, I want to tell you, brothers and sisters, that would have been a mighty big cup there that uh, provided over 3,000 souls, at least 3,012, and probably more, to get a little drink of that cup. So that, that certainly is not um, correct teaching there. But here you have the church, and verse 42 and they, the church, continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship and in breaking of bread and in prayers. 
Well, there in verse 42, we have all five acts of worship, right? You have the apostles' doctrine. There is the, the preaching and teaching. And in uh, the synagogue worship, one of the things that happened in the synagogue is the worshipers were, they had a, a reading schedule, right? And so someone would come in on their Sabbath day and read the, the scheduled reading and then exegete it. Paul did that quite often. And so there's your preaching, the apostles' doctrine. That's what that's referring to. And fellowship. Well, we have a Greek term, koinonia, which is a term that means to have things in common a common bond, and uh, we call the Lord's Supper at times the communion because it is, it's fellowship. And so in our fellowship, we have uh, giving. It's part of our fellowship. We are participating in a like-minded fashion in the work of the church in supporting the work of the church. And our singing is fellowship. We are authorized in the New Testament to sing, not to play, but to sing. Psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. Breaking of bread, there is your reference to the Lord's Supper and then prayer. So uh, I'm going to take the position right here, ladies and gentlemen, that Acts 2.42 is the first statement in the Bible uh, regarding our authority to take up the collection on the first day of the week. Let's see, I've got a question here. Um, Give me a second. All right, here is um, a statement, and uh, I'm going to leave it up just a second for you to all look at it, but then I've got to pull it down so I can read it. But here the statement is, would the saints only benevolence be considered a deletion of scripture compared to Galatians 6.10? We are not to add or delete. Um, that's, that's, uh, that is, um, well, it, it would be both adding to the word of God because they've made a teaching that is not scriptural. And um, I'll, I'll, I'll unpack it more. We're not going to get it all in today. We're going to have to come back next week and look at it as, again, there's a lot to cover here. And I'm trying to go slow enough to lay a good foundation. But, um, you know, uh, years ago, I don't know, it's been, oh, man, I don't know, maybe 20 years ago, I, I, I debated two fellows from the non-institutional Church of Christ, um, Tommy Thrasher and, um, man, the guy that runs around with him. And right now I can't remember his name. But, uh, brother. Thrasher, my erring brother Thrasher, was trying to get me to uh, take the position that the, the collection was only to be used for members of the church. And he had a series of questions that would, would, would uh, make the point that there are uh, regulations uh, about how much we can do with the scripture. So, so he said, would you admit that it would be wrong, it would be unscriptural to take money out of the collection to help someone from whom fellowship had been withdrawn? So he thought he could get me to agree to that and say, and then make the point, well, you see that, why can't you see that we are to give and only use that fun, funds for the saints only. Well, my reply was, we are to withdraw fellowship from our erring brethren. 
as we're taught in 2 Thessalonians 3, verse 6. But then we come over there to uh, chapter 5, and we are told that we are, with regard to those from whom we have withdrawn our fellowship, that we are not to treat them like an enemy, but we are to admonish them as a brother. And our Lord taught us, if thy enemy hunger, feed him. Now, if I'm not going to treat an erring with whom, from whom I've withdrawn my fellowship as an enemy, but I'm going to admonish him. If I come across him and I see that he is, uh, he doesn't have anything to eat. And I mean, he's in a bad situation. I'm going to try to help him with what he needs. And then at the same time, and, and this is something I think is very important with regard to the folks from whom we withdraw ourselves, that we take every opportunity to remind them about the fellowship and love we have in Christ. So I would, uh, in, in regard to admonishing him as a brother, I would say, look, man, why can't you, why won't you come back? Let's work this out. We love you, and we're demonstrating that love right now by helping in that need. We, we, we want to work this out, but listen, you're, you're lost in sin. You know, you make those points. But I can't imagine, I cannot imagine having a sister who's a widow. Maybe she's got some children, and maybe those children are, getting um, uh, old enough to obey the gospel, but yet they haven't. Could you imagine taking funds over to that sister and saying, hey, sister, we're going to feed you, but if you take one morsel of this food that we pour out of the church treasury and feed those of yours, you're going to hell. Listen, that is an ugly, mean, unkind teaching. Um, we can help, uh, someone ask here, uh, individuals can help, but from the church treasury, well, we're going to cover that. And yes, we can use the church treasury to help. Yes, we can. In Galatians 6.10, as we have opportunity, the Bible says, let us work that which is good toward all men. And those are believers and non-believers. But then especially we're told there to the household of the saints, right? We, we, we have to show preference to our brothers and sisters for sure. But we are not um, in error by helping those who are not members of the church. And yes, we can help from the church and we're, we'll, we'll get into that. All right. Um, so we have the pattern established here in, in Acts chapter 2 for worship. And uh, the church had needs. Let's, uh, we can look at a few of those. <laughs> and these things are going on and <clears throat> they are just um, taken as obvious facts of what the church is doing as these letters are being written. But notice that um, here in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 9, we covered this a couple of months ago. But here in uh, 9 3, they're, they're accusing Paul of uh, not being an apostle because he wouldn't uh, let them pay him. And this is what he repented for to the Corinthians. But he says, mine answer to them that do examine me is this. Have we not power to eat and to drink? Have we not power, authority, you see, to lead about a sister, a wife, as well as other apostles and as the brethren of the Lord and Cephas? Or I only and Barnabas, have we not power to forbear working? Okay, so obviously we're being told right here that 
the other apostles, uh, brothers and sisters of the Lord, right? His uh, or his brothers, James would be one half brother. And uh, Cephas, that's right. They had for bear working. They weren't, they didn't have a secular job as we call it. They're drawing their funds from the collection. There's a need the church has. And so look at verse nine, for it is written in the law of Moses, thou shalt not muzzle the ox, the mouth of the ox that treadeth out the corn. Doth God take care for oxen? Or saith he it altogether for our sakes? For our sakes, no doubt, this is written, that he that ploweth should plow in hope, and he that thresheth in hope should be partakers of his hope. Okay, now, if we have sown unto you spiritual things, the truth of the gospel of Christ, is it a great thing if we shall reap your carnal things? If others be partakers of this power, this authority. All right. So we know the church was supporting preachers, supporting the work here. And definitely that had been part of the pattern that had been delivered. And it is uh, granted. But uh, the church has various needs. Now, let me let me uh, read here. A couple of the comments that are coming in. Seems to go on Sunday, go to a sporting, a permanent preacher. And I don't know how a local church would have enough money to build gymnasiums and fellowship halls. All right, let me let me read this one. Uh, I think it is uh, the, I think it's something that we'll put up here and, and discuss. It seems that like the bulk of the contributions on Sunday goes to supporting a permanent preacher. And I don't know how a local church would have enough money to build gymnasiums and fellowship halls and kitchens and help unbelievers. Other people seems like you'd run out of money rather quickly. Well, you know, um, there are, matters of obligation that we are obligated we are bound to do and we've got to take care of those needs first of all but we have the right to go beyond and help where we can help and yes i realize we need to talk about uh, fellowship halls kitchens those kinds of things as some brethren uh, they they say, man, you're you're going to hell. You got a kitchen in your building. Wow. <laughs> uh, the church isn't authorized to eat together. You know what? Sometimes, and and I, I I'm not trying to hurt anybody's feelings, but I do wish that stupidity hurt sometimes because, you know what? We, are we losing the ability to go through the scriptures and read and? and draw out like we're doing right here. Uh, you know the church had a collection. You know it had, had a contribution. You know from Acts 2.42 that to be the case. And then you know they're using it for things that are authorized right here. They're supporting people that are preaching the truth. Um, now, let, let me take and, and hit this from a little bit different direction. because. You show me by Bible that tells you thou shalt build a meeting house. I want a verse for that. Okay, so there are some folks who say the early church met in homes. They didn't have church buildings. We don't have the right to have church buildings. Uh, again, the Bible teaches us in a couple of different ways. Roy Deaver. <laughs> in his uh, earlier years, did a lot of teaching on this. And I don't know, I would say there's probably still some good material out there that he has produced on ascertaining Bible authority. 
And if you have issues with that, I would uh, encourage you to do some uh, online searching and try to find some of that material. But you have the Bible and it uh, gives us our marching orders by command. You used to hear it said command, example, and inference, necessary inference. Um, you have direct statements, the commands in the Bible. 1 Corinthians 16, 1 and 2 is one of those. And then you have what um, we call examples. These are uh, examples of approved behaviors, apostolic examples. So we know, for example, right here in 1 Corinthians 9, the apostles were being supported from the church treasury. And uh, we have that authority then. And you'll find that uh, there's authority to even support an elder who works full time in the word. Right in prayer. In 1 Thessalonians, we have that teaching there. The double honor. That's double honor. That's what we're looking at. So we have those examples of approved behavior. And then we have what is some folks call inference. Some call necessary inference. I think all inference is necessary. But what is being inferred? You know, the scriptures make implication. We are to infer from that. We are to study and, and draw the, the necessary uh, conclusions. Okay. So let me ask again, where is our authority to build a church building period? Well, it is in the command to assemble ourselves together on the first day of the week to engage in worship. We have to have a place where at we can do that. We do. Now, Elders uh, make the final choice, right? The decisions. They could say, hey, we're, we've decided there is a Ramada down at the park and we're going to rent that every first day of the week and we're going to meet there. That's their choice. Some, and I've heard this and I'm sure many of you have, they didn't have church buildings in the first century. Yes, they did. <laughs> That is a false statement. They did have church buildings. What uh, you think about the contributions in the Old Testament to the fullness of time. In the fullness of time, Galatians 4, 4, God sent forth his son, made of a woman, made under the law, born of a woman, born Ganao. He's uh, made of a woman, the virgin birth of Christ. Well, what were the contributions then to the fullness of time? When the Jews were carried into captivity, into Babylon, they couldn't get back to Jerusalem. Nebuchadnezzar made sure of that. They couldn't get back to Jerusalem. So <laughs> there were four feasts every year that every Jewish male was required to attend. He couldn't get back there. So what did they do? They, they made a synagogue and they would worship in that synagogue. A synagogue was uh, a church building. You know what they did in the synagogue? They read the scriptures and exegeted it. They, they, they preached. They sang without ever using mechanical instruments of music, by the way. They took up a collection to support their work they gave. And, uh, you know, they prayed. If I counted right, that's four acts of worship that we do in the church. The only thing they didn't have is the Lord's Supper. Now, there, man, I have a, a somewhere in my files, uh, Biblical Archaeology, Archaeological Review magazine. I used to subscribe to that years ago. And uh, they've laid it out where they've uh, uncovered many of those synagogues. You know what they had in them? They had a baptistry. 
because the Jews under the old law had their various washings. So you have a building. They're already worshiping in that building. They've got a baptistry. This is why this is a launch pad for the church. As Paul and the other evangelists would get out in and uh, spread the gospel, the first thing they would do when they went to a place is go to the synagogue. It took 10 Jewish males to, to, to build the synagogue. And that's why in uh, Acts 16, Lydia and the, uh, some others are down by the river worshiping on that Saturday. They didn't have a synagogue there. But Paul would first, when he went to a place, he would find the synagogue. He would begin preaching the gospel. You convert a synagogue, the leaders of that synagogue, you've got an up and going congregation with a church building, with a baptistry. That's in the plan of God. Yes, it is. So they did have church buildings. They also met in people's homes, wherever they could meet. And But we have that example. It's, it, there's nothing wrong with having a church building. Now, when I was um, a student at the Memphis School of Preaching, I always thoroughly enjoyed lectureship every year. And there were folks who came from far and wide to attend the lectures. Lectures would go all day. You know, folks get hungry. You tell me what's wrong with feeding them. Now, somebody will say, well, we can't take and buy all that food out of the church treasury. <clears throat> Usually what happens there is uh, folks will bring it in potluck style. What I'm getting at here is, do we have authority for a what we call a fellowship hall? Sure we do. We have the need to have classes and teach and teach as much as we can. Maybe, maybe we're lacking in that area because uh, the church, listen, it's in a decline. Let's let's get real. Satan's after it. He's whooping it, and a lot of places are in dire straits. I was invited up to speak at a place last Lord's Day, and this congregation is uh, looking at closing its doors. It's one of their options. They Since uh, 19, they've lost about 200 members after they did the lockdowns, you know, and uh, I guess that kind of helped ferret out where people's hearts maybe really were. I don't know. But as I'm up there and talking to these brethren and trying to help where I can, I uh, learned that there are actually five congregations up in that area that are in the same position and they're looking at closing their doors. I got to speak with members of two of those congregations. And uh, every place is um, that I talk to uh, here lately, they're, they're missing a great generation. And, and we've got a lot of older saints. And then there are some younger folks that are trickling in and around here and there. But man, there's a great large group, a generation missing. That's the design of the devil. Brothers and sisters, we had better buckle our seatbelt and get into some more teaching, 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 and uh, really digest the truth. So they would have classes and, and lectures in these, this, this, uh, what they called the multi-purpose room because it had a lot of different purposes. You could throw out some tables and have a um, meal in there. What's wrong with that? Nothing, not a thing. And then someone's going to say, you don't have authority to have a refrigerator in your meeting house. Oh, we don't. We don't. Um, I would say we have as much authority for the refrigerator as we do for the toilet or a water fountain. And I'd like to, I, I want to know, you know, there, there are legalities in, in communities. You can't have a building without bathrooms and a drinking fountain. Do these saints only people stand at the door and say, if you're not a Christian, you better stay out of our water fountain. Who's paying the water bill, brethren? 
Are the individuals out of their own pocket taking turns to go down there and pay that? No, it's coming out of the contribution. The church has needs. The needs need to be met. Now, some brethren will go out and buy the fruit of the vine for a month, for six months. What's wrong with having a place in your meeting house where you can store that? Uh, I know brethren who get together and bake their own uh, bread for the uh, Lord's Supper, their unleavened bread. <clears throat> What's wrong with having a setup where you can do that? Nothing. Nothing. And if you have that, why can't you use it for uh, fellowship? Tell me. Tell me. Someone's going to say, brother, uh, listen. Eating a meal together is a false idea of fellowship. I can remember I was a young young whippersnapper in the church back in my 20s, and uh, we were at a congregation out in central Arizona, and uh, the men had designated certain men to do certain works, and uh, a friend, uh, Brother Roger, he was uh, over the fellowship. And you know what he did? He did uh, every month he planned a potluck dinner. And we said, hey, you know what? There's more to fellowship than eating. And that's true. Our worship is fellowship. Our work is fellowship. Uh, our, our walk together in Christ is fellowship. But eating is part of fellowship. If not, look, look, I want you to come over here with me. We're, we're in 1 Corinthians. Let's go back and review briefly in 1 Corinthians chapter 5. Uh, here you have a brother, someone who's obeyed the gospel. And he looked at his stepmother and said, <laughs> and he started fornicating with his stepmother. And the church, I don't know what they were doing. Paul said they were puffed up and they should have mourned. I I wonder when I brethren today say it's like, well, we're just going to love them back into fellowship. Is that um, what um, what we're looking at here? But uh, there is um, the need then, Paul says, to deliver in verse 5, to deliver such a one unto Satan for the destruction of the flesh, right? And that's an elliptical statement, the destruction of the works of the flesh, that the spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. All right, so there to uh, withdraw fellowship from this person. And then he said, I wrote unto you an epistle not to company, that's the idea of fellowship, with fornicators. Yet not altogether with the fornicators of this world or with the covetous or extortioners or idolaters for then must ye go out of the world, right? We're going to have uh, contact with people in the world all the time who are in sin. But when it comes to a brother or sister, we have to take a different approach here if they're going to live in sin. Now, Look at verse 11. But now I have written unto you not to keep company, not to fellowship. If any man that is called a brother be a fornicator or covetous or an idolater or a railer or a drunkard or an extortioner with such a one, no, not to eat. You can't fellowship them. You can't eat with them. Eating is an act of fellowship. Right. And it's a really uh, a sad that some would say we can't come together in, in our multi-purpose room and, and eat a meal together. Friends, that is going beyond the scriptures. That's going beyond what is written in the word of God. Um, <laughs> Jewel. I love you, sister. All right. So, you know, we uh, we do have examples of behavior that will tell us we can have a meeting house. Let's I'm running low on time. I'm going to hit um, 
Acts 27 through 12. Acts 27 through 12. And upon the first day of the week, Sunday, when the disciples came together to break bread, that's the breaking bread in Acts 2.42. This is the Lord's Supper. Paul preached unto them, ready to depart on the morrow, and continued his speech until midnight. Boy, he was a long-winded preacher. There were many lights in the upper chamber where they were gathered together. And there sat in the, a window a certain young man named Eutychus, being fallen down into a deep sleep. And as Paul was long preaching, he sunk down with sleep and fell from the third loft and was taken up dead. Killed him. Right? Paul's preaching killed him. And so Paul went down and fell on him and embracing him said, trouble not yourselves for his life is in him. Paul raised him, uh, performed this miracle. When he therefore was come up again and had broken bread. Now let's logically go through this. They come together, verse seven, on the first day of the week, that's Sunday. And they break bread. They have their preaching. They have their worship. Paul preaches and he just keeps in, in the early church, by the way, many times they would um, meet on Sunday night evening because there were members of the church who were slaves and they couldn't get away in the morning. So they would come together in the evening. That's what you're seeing here. And Paul just kept on preaching. So. Uh, again, Troas is a city that would follow Roman customs. They would follow Roman time. And the Romans would keep time like we do. So Paul has been preaching and he hits the midnight hour and Eutychus falls out of the, the window and he's dead. So he's dead now on Monday morning. This is no longer on Sunday. This is Monday morning. Paul goes down, he brings his life back to him. They come back upstairs and <laughs> broke bread. And he then talked for a long while, even to the breaking of, uh, till the break of day, and then he departed. Now, you have two different references here to breaking bread. The first one is the Lord's Supper on the first day of the week. The second, they had breakfast together. Right, they ate together in the same place they worshiped. Don't tell me that it's unscriptural for the saints to come together where they're worshiping and uh, eat together. If it's wrong to eat in the meeting house, then why do these non institutional preachers sometimes take a sandwich lunch with them to their meeting to, to their office? In the church, treasury, paying for that office. And it just amazes me that they don't have any problem with uh, defecating in a church building, being paid for by the church treasury, or having a drinking fountain, uh, any of these things. Maybe having some plants in there that you have to water and, and take care of. And listen, you know what? <laughs> some folks want to hang on to a doctrine they have created and it's going to cost their souls. We've got to learn to follow the examples and the behaviors that were approved of in the early church. And this idea that um, you can't eat in your meeting house, brothers and sisters, is just wrong. It's just wrong. And a lot of people will lose their souls because of it. it, it it's sad. Well, listen, I'm going to stop right here. And you know where we're going next week, because we've got a lot to look at on what we can do out of that treasury, how we can help others uh, who are not members of the Lord's church. I really am going to take some time to develop all of that. 
And I do thank you for your time because I realize you can be out doing other things, but here you are with me studying the word of God. And I appreciate it and uh, love you all. And um, we'll look forward to being with you again next uh, Thursday morning.